and welcome to day two of IoT Design Week. Today we'll be talking about artificial intelligence in IoT. I am joined by Kashif Khan, the CEO and co-founder of Motion Gestures. Hello. How are you doing? Excellent. Hello. Good to have you. And on Skype we have Neelam Ruparelia, the Microchips IoT segment leader for 5G and AI. How are you, Neelam? Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, Kashif. Good morning, Neelam. So very excited to have everyone on today. This is the first time we're talking about AI on a live stream. So um, I'm really excited about that. And yeah, we also have a live stream this afternoon. So make sure you stay tuned for this one and stay tuned for that one because we have a lot of content coming your way. Um, I'm going to take it back to the booth and they'll tell you a little bit about the free sample available today and how to get that. Howdy. So my name is Clifford Swartz, and I'm here with Daniel Ho. And uh, I'm super excited about the topic today. Yeah. I'm excited about day two. I know you you were on stage day one. Yes, and I'm back in the safety of the booth. But <laughs> later today in our second live stream, I'll be back on the the stage. Don't worry. Nice. Yeah. So let's talk about the free samples. Yeah. So we're gonna today as same as yesterday. We're gonna have five winners. We're gonna drop a survey link at the end of the live stream, and there are five. The first five. Uh, people who yeah. finish the survey is going to get a free uh, SAM t uh, D21 yep, yep. Curiosity Nano board, which is a great board, that board featured with a M0 32-bit MCU. You got it. And so, as always, people in the booth will be monitoring your questions. We're multicasting on three different platforms, so we'll do our best to try to manage and get questions onto the stage. But if we do not get time, or if in one way or another we don't get to your question, make sure to email us at livestream at microchip.com and we'll be sure to forward that, uh, that question on to the relevant people. Yeah. But uh, very excited, thank you for having us. Uh, back to the stage. All right, thank you. Um, so before we dive into motion gestures, um, I wanted to kind of back up a little bit and get an overview. Um, and so this is to both Neelam and Kashif. I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about why AI and IoT. Sure, Rachel, maybe if I can jump in. Um, First of all, this is a great show that we put together today uh, about AI. Uh, it's a very valid question. Uh, if you look at the industry, let's say 12 months back, most of the AI activity has been mostly in the cloud. There's also impression about AI requiring very high amount of computer resources, which has all been valid up until 12 months back. Over the last 12 months, there's a lot of research in the industry that allows implementation of AI on, let's say, low compute resource devices like microcontrollers, microprocessors, at least, et cetera. So now it's feasible to implement AI on the IoT devices. But more importantly, we are also seeing a lot of our customers able to and wanting to implement AI because they can add more features, create new products, um, enable some exciting new uh, outcomes for their end customers. And so we see a lot of demands on AI on IoT devices as well. You know, you can you can imagine things like, um, you know, home vacuum robots or washing machine and even factory floor robots, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, possible, you know, very exciting potential outcome for end customers using AI into these IoT devices. So it's the timing couldn't be better. This is this is the perfect time for AI to be in IoT, and this is why we are very excited to bring up uh, AI on microchip platform. So with that, Rachel, if you uh, if you can put up the slide, I can even talk a little bit about uh, AI in microchip devices. Yeah. So this is a this is a great view of variety of different things we at microchip are enabling on AI. So first of all, if you see on the on the top left side, smart embedded vision, we are able to bring um, not only the vision uh, signal processing on our FPGAs, but also putting artificial intelligence in there for, for example, doing a object recognition or person recognition, et cetera. Uh, next thing on the list is preventive maintenance. It's a little bit early, but we see a lot of customers uh, very keen to implement things like Monitoring the monitoring the voltage, current, uh, power, temperature, etc., in order to identify any potential issue with the devices like 
HVAC or power grid or any or most kind of motors and so on. So all of this allows customers to, let's say, create a flag and say, <clears throat> hey, there's a need for a maintenance for this particular product. And AI is a perfect thing to do, a perfect thing to use for that. If you go on the lower right, uh, there are a lot of other applications that AI can be used for. For example, audio or gesture recognition and different types of control in industrial domain. And last but not the least, um, AI's primary domain that's been for the last few years is the training and inference, and primarily on the cloud base, but also we are seeing in automotive, there's a lot of um, AI data center type of application emerging. And we have products in all of these areas. So microchip is kind of in a unique position to be able to leverage uh, cloud to the edge uh, AI and enable that for our customers. So this is a little bit of background. Hopefully that's useful. Um, we are very excited. We have this talk right now with motion gestures. And later today, we also have another partner coming in talking about uh, AI on the microcontrollers in the afternoon. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Back to you. Thanks, Neil. That was a great overview. Um, that really clarified a lot of things for me. So thank you. Um, Kashif, do you want to answer that question, the broad just overview of why we would use AI in IoT? I think Neelam has touched on all uh, uh, the key points. I believe there are three main uh, issues here. First is the advancement in AI, which I believe will have almost as fundamental an impact on the economy as the invention of electricity in the 19th century. And believe me, that's not hyperbole. Second is, uh, main trend is the IoT, which means any and all devices getting connected to the internet. And the third trend here is, I would say, proliferation of sensors, use of sensors in connected devices. So when you put the three things together, there is a need for intelligent software that can be installed in devices on the edge, which can interpret the output of sensors intelligently, pretty much the way <clears throat> how the human brain interprets the output of the five senses. And that is what makes the devices intelligent and responsive to their environment. So that's how I would put it with AI on the edge in the context of IoT. That's interesting. I like the connection between the senses and AI. Um, that's really, I, I like that. Um, my mom always says that I, my hearing is selective, but uh, you get it. So um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do uh, at Motion Gestures? So we focus on AI-based gesture recognition. And what we have done is built a software platform which leverages advances in AI to accomplish two things, significantly reduce the time to market and the development cost for building gesture recognition software, and number two, significantly increase customer experience, especially in the context of recognition accuracy of gestures and naturalness and intuitiveness of gestures. We believe we are heading towards an era, or we are probably are already in an era of multimodal interaction in which a variety of mechanisms are available or will be available to customers to interact with products and apps, such as you know voice recognition, keyboards, uh, mouse, buttons, and also gesture recognition. And basically, it will be up to the user to use any combination of these modalities to interact with the product or app, depending on the situation, meaning the task to be performed, and depending on their style. And AI here plays a very big role <coughs> in reducing the development time and costs and increasing recognition accuracy. So what is a gesture? Great question. So it depends on the sensor one is working with. Typically, a gesture is made with hand and fingers. So if you're working, let's say, with, a, with touch sensors, like a trackpad or a touch panel, anytime you tap, you swipe, that's a gesture. It could be something more elaborate. If you were to draw a character or a letter or a number on a, on a touch screen, that would be a touch gesture. If you're working with motion sensors, uh, also known as inertial sensors, such as accelerometer, gyroscope, and maybe you're wearing, and which are, let's say, in a wearable device, like a armband or a fitness band, anytime you move your arm, it could be rotating a wrist or moving the arm in the form of a letter, number, symbol shape, that would be a gesture. And when you're working with cameras, a gesture could be anything you do with your hand and fingers. It could be as simple as interpreting signs like thumbs up, OK symbol, 
It could be tracking your fingertip when you interact, let's say, with the 3D space around you, real or virtual. It could also be something more complex like tapping, grabbing, twisting, swiping. So it really depends on, on the sensor you're working with. But basically, it's, it's, it's movements made by hand and fingers. Okay, okay, that clarifies things, thank you. Which I might add is very significant because if you think about how we as human beings lead our, our lives, we do most of our communication with voice. That's mm -hmm. our preferred medium. And you know, that's one of the reasons why AI-based voice recognition took off. And if you think about it, we do most of our work with our hands. So if we can implement sophisticated AI-based hand control, if you will, let's say with, with cameras or radar sensors, that creates you know, a very big advantage in, in, in interacting with products or apps. Oh, yeah, okay, cool, yeah. I use gestures all the time already. Um, so when I've heard a lot about cost associated with adding artificial intelligence to a hardware design, um, and it seems like really infeasible to do, but you were talking a lot about how motion gestures helps you reduce that cost and makes it a lot more feasible for you to add AI into a hardware design. So can you talk a little bit about how you do that? Sure. Well, the primary driver of cost with any machine learning system is data. Uh, because the system learns machine learning, it learns from data. So typically what this involves is for gesture recognition, you collect data consisting of samples for the required gesture, which can range anywhere from hundreds of thousands to millions. And that obviously has a very direct bearing on cost. The cost it takes to collect this data, the cost it takes to annotate it, label it, clean it, and then you have to obviously test the data in, in the form of algorithms it can train. And if you're not satisfied with the result, the process has to be repeated. So there could be several iterations. So the main issue here is data collection. What we have done at Motion Gestures is completely eliminated the need for the client to collect any data. And this has allowed us to reduce the time to market and development costs by at least 10x by a factor of 10. What typically used to take several weeks can now be done, I would say, in a few hours. What, would take, what typically would take uh, several months can be done at most in a few days. Again, no data collection, despite using machine learning algorithms. The second main issue here is, uh, in gesture recognition, is programming. Typically, the path to be followed by gesture, that's a motion trajectory, that needs to be programmed. We have also solved that problem in our development platform without by completely eliminating programming. And the related problem here is that if you go to the trouble of doing programming and collecting data for using conventional technology for a set of gestures, you typically do this for gestures that can only be used with a specific sensor. So let's say you want to do a certain number of gestures. We're using hand and, hands and fingers like thumbs up, OK symbol, victory sign, open palm, etc and you do this for a color camera. Now you want to use the same gestures, let's say for an infrared camera, or a monochrome camera, or an infrared depth camera. In each case, you start the process all over again. And this is also the case when you switch between different class of sensors. So let's say I make a gesture in the form of a clockwise circle with my finger. And let's say I have done this for a normal webcam camera, but I also want to use the clockwise circle on a trackpad. Or, or on a touch screen or with motion sensors, again, I have to start the process all over again for data collection. And again, we have solved that problem by making gestures transferable across different sensors. You build them once without collecting any data, without doing any program, and you can use them across a broad category of sensors without any retraining. Oh, okay, that's really cool. I remember in an earlier conversation you men mentioned, you were talking about like a connected car and multimodal and how there's so many different gestures you interact with the car and so that makes sense why you'd want a lot of different sensors to be able to recognize the same um, or a similar gesture. Um, so that's really cool. Um, how do you ensure that it's accurate? Well, the way to, to test a gesture is by comparing, I would say, the intent of the user with the recognition results produced by the system. So this is a subtle point because when people make a particular gesture, let's say I'm doing a thumbs up, uh, in my mind, I know what I've done. And if the system doesn't recognize what I did, then from my point of view, it's the system's 
fault. Mm -hmm. It's the same as if we were engaging in a in a verbal communication, let's say, with with with, with each other. Uh, if you have to repeat what you said because your interlocutor did not understand what you said, then you know that's a communication problem. So the recognition accuracy really is that in overwhelming majority of the cases, well over 99 percent, almost 100 percent, the gesture that is performed can be correctly understood. Now the problem with conventional systems is there is limited variation around the core gesture that can be understood. So let's say I make a gesture like, like um, OK symbol in front of a camera. And this is how I make it. But somebody else might make it like this, see? Or, or rotated arm like this, or this, or a different angle. In their mind, they made the OK gesture. And it's the job of the system to be able to correctly recognize it. And mm -hmm. what we have done is we have significantly improved AI algorithms so that a wide variety of variations of the same gesture to incorporate different styles, individual styles, can also be correctly, correctly recognized. Hence, the recognition accuracy is close to 100%. Interesting. OK. So I've heard a lot about training in mm -hmm. AI. So how, how do you do the training for your motion gestures SDK? So first and foremost, we do not require any data collection whatsoever. I've already said this before. So if, let's say, regardless of the sensor, regardless of the gestures, there is no demand in any, in any condition and under any circumstances made on a client to create sample data. Nor is there any billing or cost, if you will, for us to embark on data collection. Rather, what we have done is we have developed algorithms which are able to generate synthetic data, which can serve as a very good proxy of real life data. That's the first point. And the second point is we have developed uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms that can extrapolate from a very small amount of data. So first of all, you can generate, generate data artificially, synthetically, which serves again as a good proxy. And then you can extrapolate from it thousands of times to get a very, very good result. Oh, OK. I, was there a question in the booth? Uh, I didn't know if I, if I heard or if not. Uh, nothing yet, but if you guys do have questions, make sure to leave them in the comments. So. Yeah, actually, uh, I think Ger I believe Gerard has a question, oh. but it's more like a discussion about like he's asking about OpenCV. So I'm um, actually it's out of my curiosity. Like, do we use OpenCV? Is there an OpenCV implementation in uh, our product? Uh, Neelam, do you do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I can I can comment on that. So. Uh, from the motion gesture perspective, they provide you the final outcome, so you don't need to use OpenCV. When it comes to different microchip platforms, uh, yes, we are in the process of enabling our customers to use OpenCV. Uh, you will see some new announcement coming in from microchip over the next couple of months where we will allow you to actually implement your own algorithms using OpenCV, maybe also using TensorFlow and, and other um, frameworks and open source tools implementing AI on microchip uh, devices. Uh, stay tuned, it'll be very soon. We will get, we'll get a few announcements coming out for you. That was a great question. Um, and and Neela mentioned TensorFlow. Uh, that's going to be our conversation this afternoon with Adafruit. So if you're interested in TensorFlow, make sure to tune in later this afternoon too. Is there any other questions? Yeah, we actually have one more from Joshua Young. Uh, how do you ensure your synthetic data represents real scenario data? So what we have done is we have also developed algorithms which simulate different conditions. And they are able to add what you might call is noise in the, in, in the data, which has been generated synthetically. So that noise is what allows a wide variety of variations of the same gesture to be correctly interpreted. In other words, if you think about gesture uh, as, let's say, a, a particular model, and you think of the noise element as creating a, a wide variety of variations of that model taken together, they're able to take into account a wide va variety of variations of natural human style in performing the same gesture. So we have done exhaustive testing, and it works very, very well. That's a really good question, too. I feel like all week we've had great questions so far, so keep, keep it up. Keep asking good questions. Um, 
if, there, uh, if we're going to take a break from the questions, we can go back to our main discussion. Um, so, Kasha, what kind of sensors does motion gesture support? So, we currently support three categories of gestures. Motion sensors, which are inertial sensors, such as accelerometers, gyroscopes, magnetometers, touch sensors, which can be used you know, in a trackpad, in a touch panel, glass panel, you name it, and cameras. Within cameras, we work with three different types of cameras. Your normal webcam camera, a color camera, RGB sensor, that is. Also, near-infrared cameras, which can see in all lighting conditions, including dark, like NIR cameras. And then infrared depth cameras, such as time of flight. Though I must add, we are able to execute most 3D gestures without depth information. So we don't need something like time of flight we can work with NIR or, or RGB even for 3D gestures. That's great. And um, so for motion and touch, what kind of platforms do you work with or like what microchip products does that, those, uh, does that work with? So we are computationally very, very light. Uh, Neelam also talked about this at the beginning of this introduction, how important it is to be able to implement sophisticated AI algorithms on the edge, especially low compute devices. So we are so efficient that very sophisticated gesture recognition, let's say with inertial sensors, motion sensors, and touch sensors, can be embedded in something as simple, as basic as ARM Cortex M0 chip. And that's the cheapest chip out there. So we can do this in Cortex M0. We can obviously do this in Cortex M4 and also Cortex A5, all of which are available you know, from microchip. And I should also add, we have optimized our software to run on uh, microchips platforms, so you'll get, you'll get even better performance. Nice, we love to hear that. <laughs> um, what about camera gestures? So camera gestures require more computational resources. That's for the obvious reason, because the image is quite rich, though we use less computational resources than others. So generally speaking, we can implement uh, the camera-based gesture recognition system, which also includes hand tracking for a single hand meaning for one person, right hand or left hand, on, on, uh, on Cortex-A7. OK, that's good to know. Um, do you guys focus on a specific type of application or vertical, or do you touch every application? We, the technology has been designed to be completely application in independent, literally. And obviously, it is vertical independent as well. Perhaps you could pu pull up a slide here. So just to give you an idea, let's go from left to right clockwise. And you can use gestures in, in a wide variety of verticals. For example, on the left, variables, home appliances, anything inside a smart home, whether it is opening or closing garage doors or turning on and off lights, I mean, lowering or raising blinds in automotive environment, whether it's inside the car, such as using gestures to interact with climate control, navigation system, infotainment system, opening, closing sunroofs, automotive exterior environment, such as opening doors, that's a keyless entry, opening trunks, and even for you know, uh, interaction between pedestrians and autonomous vehicles, such as a pedestrian in a crosswalk signaling as a precaution to an approaching autonomous vehicle you know, to, to stop. It can be used with motorcycles, especially with motorcycle helmets, which are, di which are digital, to manipulate information being projected on, um, on helmet screens or to change volume control in transportation systems uh, for, let's say, uh, uh, airplanes or, or trains, where, let's say, you don't need to touch the LCD panel in front of you, and you can use gestures to select various options, drone control, I should also mention mobile apps, because a, a ordinary smartphone has motion, touch, and camera sensors, all three built into it. So you can gesture enable any app. Think about any time you're doing a selfie, how you could use hand and fingers based gestures to, to select various options. Uh, obviously, for healthcare, for uh, retail, contactless uh, gesture, uh, contactless interaction is a very big thing, especially now in the context of you know, coronavirus. Uh, you can use it for robots in military, in vending machines, you know, banking machines, video games, virtual reality. So this goes on and on. I think there's a general misconception that gestures typically are used by people who, uh, pardon me, are perhaps handicapped. That not, that's not true. 
if, even if you look around, you'll see how often people use their hands when they're talking for emphasis. So in this context, gestures can be used, you know, in a multimodal uh, HMI mechanism in a wide variety of applications, in a wide variety of industries. Love to hear the selfie thing. Um, lots of options available there. Sure. Uh, I think we have another question in the booth. Yes, we yeah. do. Actually, it's been really hard. Uh, yeah, in, as in discussion the second we that. ask, there's been a yeah. flood, and uh, we'll do our best. Uh, I believe more than one people are asking, is this technology something related to the, uh, are we using the 3D gesture, Microchip this, Microchip's 3D gesture uh, in the application? So we are independent of Microchip in the sense that our technology has been developed by us. So this is not Microchip's uh, 3D technology, which we are aware of, is if that's what you're asking, but it does allow you to create 3D gestures. Now, if I understand correctly, Neelam can can step in. I believe the 3D gesture, Microchip 3D gesture, uses a capacitive sensor. Am I correct, Neelam? Here. So, uh, Microchip has multiple uh, touch and gesture recognition platforms in the market, including capacitive uh, uh, gesture recognition. Um, so, as let me elaborate a little bit more. So as you know, Microchip is a broad portfolio company. And what we aim to do is really make uh, life easier for our customers when you want to implement something that you like to implement. So in order to do that, we bring in multiple platforms to the market. We have our own Jest ICs and other Jest rec gesture recognition products. In addition, the motion gesture technology will be supported on MCU, MPU, and in coming days on IPGs as well. So that's our um, that's our approach to bringing, you know, wide r range of technologies to you guys. So we are a partner of Microchip, and this technology was developed by Motion Gestures and is being made available on uh, Microchip's platforms, as I mentioned to you, M0, M3, A5 for motion and touch uh, gestures, A7 and FPGAs for camera-based gesture recognition, and it has all the attributes which I described to you earlier. No programming, no data collection, close to 100% recognition accuracy, and being able to use the same gestures subject to sensor limitations um, across different sensors. Over Great, to that was a good question. Uh, are there any other questions? I also have a question from um, uh, Vishnap, and uh, is asking how are false gestures avoided when you're doing either the training or the de detection? Great question. So we have algorithms uh, uh, which deal with what's known as uh, out of vocabulary detection. Like you do a gesture or you which was not specifically built in, that would be rejected. Or it could be a casual movement, uh, let's say normal natural movement, which you want to avoid recognizing. So first of all, we have these algorithms which reject specifically identify and reject what we call quote unquote out of vocabulary gestures. And second, we also have what you might call fine tuning techniques, uh, meaning techniques we can use to improve gesture recognition. If certain movements, uh, random movements uh, are quite common, we can force, force their recognition, but reject their results. So this way, the random movement is not falsely mapped to a gesture that needs to be recognized. It is being recognized and rejected without affecting the application. That's, that was good. Um, any other questions we should get to now? I think, we I think we're good for right okay. now. But. All right, well, and um, just to demo the microchip hardware component you were just talking about, you brought a couple demos too, so maybe we should move on to showing those. Sure, so I bought uh, demos for all three sensors. Uh, touch sensors, motion sensors, and camera. So let's start with um, touch sensors. Here I have a microchip evaluation uh, board, which has a Cortex-A5 uh, chip and an LCD screen. And what we have done is we have put in gestures in six different categories. Uh, you can see on my screen I have capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, uh, symbols, shapes, and even some characters, such as those used in Chinese and uh, Japanese. So what we can do is you can make a gesture with your fingertip, 
So let's say I make a 2. And here you can see the recognition result. So I could have made a small 2. I could have made it a big one in a different style. It will still recognize it. And all of these were created, I repeat, without programming, without training data. So let's try something different. Here is at sign. Again, it could be in a different style. It would again, you know, recognize it. We can try a character. This is Japanese ue. Don't ask me what it means, but hey, it's right there. Here's Japanese yama, also used in Chinese, so on and so forth. So I'll go back to the gestures. Uh, here you have, uh, you can count one, two, three, four, five, six, six different categories, and each category you have uh, two examples. So 12 gestures, assume there are four variations of each gestures. So these 48 variations could all be fit, can be fit on a Cortex M0 chip. So you can have, let's say, 12 distinct gestures with four variations each running on M0, Cortex M0. And if you ask me how long it took for us to create these gestures, again, without data collection, without programming, uh, it took us about 10, 10, 15 minutes. And all this is available for, uh, for demonstration. Uh, I will now turn to uh, motion gestures. And here I have a evaluation, uh, microchips evaluation board, uh, which contains a ARM Cortex M4 chip. It also has accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. Use of magnetometer is optional, but we do recommend accelerometer and gyroscope to negate each other's errors. And these same gestures could be used with the, uh, with the um, motion sensor system. So let's take a look. Here you can see I just made a two, and you can see the two here. I apologize for the small screen. Now, something to keep in mind is these gestures can be made in any plane. I could have made them, for example, in a vertical plane, in a horizontal plane, any angle in between. They would have been recognized. The movement could have been big. It could have been small. It all depends on sensor specifications. I could have even have changed my grip as I was making the gesture, and it still would have been recognized. This is to early earlier comment about high recognition accuracy. So let's try something else. Here, I just made an at sign, and you can see the at was correctly recognized. So the same gestures that you see on the, on the touch screen uh, can be done with motion gestures, uh, motion sensors as well. Now let's turn to camera-based system. Uh, let me just log in here. So I'm running this off, uh, off of uh, CPU and GPU, but the whole system for a single hand only can be implemented on a, a, ARM, a ARM Cortex A7 chip. Let's let it load first. And what I have here is a regular webcam camera. It's RGB. Uh, there is no stereo vision. There is no depth information. Just one second, please. Here we go. So this is more than gesture recognition. So first, I want to demonstrate to you what is known as hand tracking. We offer very sophisticated hand tracking, which is skeletal structure and joints based. So typically what we do is we are able to detect and track hand and finger movements at the joint level. You see, I raise my hand and I am able to detect a skeletal structure or rather impose a skeletal structure on the detected hand and the detection is at the joint level. If I go closer, you can see the various uh, dots. Those are the joints. And we are detecting 21 joints in, 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 in the hand. Four joints per finger, and the 21st joint being the wrist. And this joint detection can take place, uh, takes place from any angle. No matter what I'm doing, no matter what the camera angle is, no matter what the hand view is, etc. It can work. With, with multiple hands, I'm picking an object, I'm swiping something, I'm tapping, I'm grabbing, 
I am twisting, it, it will work. So this is a very powerful feature because this is what allows a very sophisticated interaction with a 3D environment, whether it's a real environment as in I am right now or it is virtual. So we are able to place, thanks to the joint detection, place the hand in the environment. So take an example here. Let's say I did a, I did a tapping gesture. This is a gesture, but let's say there are four buttons in front of me, any one of which, or four many options in front of me, any one of which I could have tapped. We cannot determine this information from the gesture alone of tapping. Only with joints level hand detection information can we figure out which of those four options was tapped. So this allows very sophisticated control using hand and finger movements for any, any item, Great. any application. I think we have another question in the booth. Please. Yes, we do. So this question is from Jimmy Andrianto, and he's very interested in the demos that you just showed, and he's asking if the Motion Gestures SDK ID is free to use. 100% free to use. Even the demos that I've showed you, uh, those are available free of charge for you to test, and all you need to do is con contact your local micro uh, microchip rep, and uh, you can get those demos, and you can get the SDK to test as well. Cool. Thank you very much. And we got somebody else also interested in that board. Uh, Richard is asking what's the name of the board that you're showing. I don't have the microchips. Board. Oh, I can read it if Please. you know. Uh, go ahead, Rachel. It looks like we got a Sam G55 Explained Pro um, with an OLED 1 Explained Pro extension. And we have a Sam A5 D2. Uh, explained ultra and then um, it looks like a touch uh, it says microchip MEB adapter um, so it looks like a touch adapter on that uh, let Thank me you. make one other comment which uh, is I think also very relevant uh, I mentioned several times that um, the motion and touch sensor systems can also be implemented on cortex M0 and we have a demo running uh, on cortex M0 and maybe Neelam can elaborate on this. The touch panel, which, which comes with the M, uh, M0 chip, actually has a quite weak resolution compared to this LCD panel. Yet you get very high recognition accuracy. Let me say it to you differently. If you were to connect that touch panel, let's say to a TV monitor, and actually see the gestures that you are making on the low resolution panel, you will notice that the image that's being produced is quite different from what you actually drew because it doesn't have the res high resolution of this uh, LCD screen. Yet, the same gestures, meaning trained with the same algorithms, are able to produce the same accuracy. Back to my earlier comment, how a wide variety of variations around the core trajectory can be correctly interpreted. Elam, you may want to talk about that, DM0? Yeah, so let me uh, let me add a couple points to what you said, Kasif. Um, I just I want to make sure one thing very um, very emphatically. Um, we re we are really excited about the motion gestures technology. One of the big reason is that the technology is is portable on variety of different devices. Of course, the device compute capacity and the you know the the kit, the LCD resolution, etc will reflect into the results but the core technology the same touch based um, gesture recognition or motion based gesture recognition is portable and available on microchip platforms on uh, cortex m0 cortex m4 cortex a5 all of those platforms uh, each of these technologies is available except the camera base the camera base requires more resources uh, for computation, and that will be available on A7 and the FPGA class of devices. Um, so I hope that answers the question, um, and it kind of explains why we are excited about motion gestures as well. Yeah, that's a that's a good clarification. Um, are there any other questions in the booth? Uh, there's one more that I'd like to ask, and this one is coming from Jared. He's asking if you could do the same camera demo if it was black and white with a lower resolution. Or in other words, like what's the lower limit of right. the resolution can be, I believe. So the camera type doesn't matter. You brought up black and white. Let's call it technically a monochrome. So you don't need color. Uh, I mentioned earlier you can work with 
a color camera RGB with, with infrared. It can also be monochrome, as you said, or infrared depth. Now, the second question is, what should be the camera resolution? I think the, the way to answer that is it depends on what you want to do, meaning what type of gesture you want to perform and from what distance. So there are two types of gestures. Uh, there are actually three types, but let, let's, let's do it by example. So if you want to focus on interpreting the stationary position of a hand, these are called static gestures, like you can see here, open palm, closed fist, victory sign, thumbs up, you know, OK symbol, etc. You need a camera which can produce 30 frames per second. If you want to do dynamic or action gestures which involve tracking of movements, such as I'm swiping, see, or you're doing tapping, or it could be something more sophisticated where, where you are tracking the fingertip or a middle of a palm. So you see, I'm tracking my fingertip. We recommend you use 60 FPS, 60 frames per second, though you can get away with 40 to 50 frames per second. The reason is obvious, there is motion involved. We need to see the image before we can impose the skeletal structure. Now, there's one more angle. We, all we care about, we never care about the image. We only care about the area around the hand. And this has been very clearly identified in a bounding box. So generally speaking, again, there are some variations around it. There is some flexibility. But generally speaking, the, for the hand area, we need a resolution of 96 by 96 pixels. It can be lower than that. But generally speaking, I'm repeating, it's a tricky point. We need 96 by 96 pixels of the hand area resolution. And you can calculate you know, the resolution of the camera working backwards. So if you can give us 96 by 96 pixels, you can even do gestures, let's say, from 10 feet away. No issues. Great. Yeah, so if I can chime in, um, we've seen a lot of uh, camera-based um, AI implementation. And, you know, we have AI in general is feasible to implement on camera-based uh, system all the way down to 240, uh, 240 by 240 type of image resolu resolution. Um, specifically for gesture with, with uh, motion gestures technology, I think you have the answer of 96 by 96 pixel for hand recognition. What that means is if you have a low resolution camera, you can still use very low resolution camera. You can still use this technology as long as the distance is not large and the hand shows up in the, in the frame with that level of resolution. If you use high resolution camera, it can even recognize from a longer distance. Right? So that, that makes this technology very unique and very uh, portable on a variety of different, different platforms. Exactly right. L let me go back to the earlier question which was asked how we generate data or what sort of data collection we do. So the camera is a very interesting case. So the normal way to do or the conventional way to do uh, machine learning for use with camera-based uh, gesture recognition is to collect again, samples, uh, a very large number of samples of images. So if you look at the screen right now, let's say I want to do a gesture which is in the form of an open palm. I will need to collect hundreds of thousands of, of images or maybe millions of images showing an open palm. And more specifically, I will need to take into account a wide variety of variables such as hand size, hand positions, hand pigmentation, background information, lighting conditions, camera angles. We don't need any of these. And the reason for this is, for us, the most important thing is being able to impose with very high accuracy the joints-based skeletal structure that you see. If we are able to impose it, we can base hand tracking and gesture recognition simply based on the skeletal structure. So all those conventional variables that I just mentioned earlier, I'm not going to repeat them. We don't need to take them into account. So that is what reduces, in the case of camera, or in the case of a sensor as sophisticated as camera, the development time from several months to, to basically a few days. And the system is very, very robust because a wide variety of variations can be correctly interpreted. So let's take some examples. So here I'm doing an open palm. You, you can see above the bounding box, it's telling me this is the right hand, front view. It's also IDing the hand. The ID is 39. Every time a hand comes into camera view, it gives an ID. And it's saying, OK, the gesture is open palm up. But it can also give you a different direction. So let's say it's open palm right. 
You can see this changes. I'm now doing open palm left, but the hand view has changed from right hand to back view. And I could have even have changed the, 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 the angle, the positions. It still would not affect the reading. Maybe the fingers come closer or there is no gap even between the thumb and the finger, still the reading remains the same. You can try this, let's say, with gesture OK. See, no matter how I move, I'm able to correctly recognize this, and so on and so forth. Similarly, we can do very sophisticated 3D gestures, a question that was asked earlier, with a 2D camera. There is no depth information, there is no stereo vision, and this is normal webcam camera. But look, I can tap. You can see the tapping result right here. I am tapping, and that is by moving my finger you know, along the depth dimension without having any depth information. And tapping is one of the core you know, building blocks of, of building any gesture control applications using cameras. I can also do swipes. Swipe left, swipe right, it doesn't matter. And there can be very sophisticated finger tracking, middle of the palm tracking, or whatever. And these can also contain gestures. Remember my earlier comment? that how the same gestures that we built once can be used with any sensor. I demoed this to you with touch, with motion. Well, we can do the same gestures here. Here is a two. It could be an at, and, and so on and so forth. So very versatile system. Over to you, Rachel. Sure. Um, so we're running a little short on time. But I was wondering if you could show us, like, how, show all the viewers how a gesture is created. So let's take an example of a touch sensor system. You have some slides. So basically, we'll step through three slides. And all we want to do is show you first that a gesture, you don't need to do any programming. Uh, earlier slide, please. We don't need to do any programming. And all we need to do here is draw the outline of the gesture. You can trace the outline with your fingertip. So on the right-hand side is a mobile app using an Android phone. And on the left-hand side is the SDK. So the app is communicating with the SDK. And uh, let's play it. So you can see the person outlined an X in handwriting style using his fingertip. And then if he or she is satisfied with the drawing, they can save the drawing. And the system then sends the, the drawing to the SDK. Let's go to the next slide, Leishu. And what, the, uh, please play it. And what happens here is the drawing is converted into a gesture, which you can see on the left. Sorry, uh, it's <laughs> I'm okay. not sure how to use this. Uh, uh, why don't you control it? So Thanks. let's play this. Oops. Wait. I apologize. Let's see what happens. We go to the next one. And this will play. We can't hear the audio here, just bear with me. So on the left-hand side is the drawing. And this is the most important part. You can see, as he clicked on the drawing, that's the gesture. A gesture has three components here, which you can see here. It first has dimensions. In this case, the dimensions are x and y. It also has a trajectory, the path to be followed by the gesture, which you can see is what we created from the drawing. And then it has the the direction to be followed by the gesture, which is the moving red dot. Let's, let's take a look, look at it again. So all three of these components, the dimensions, the trajectory, and the direction were inferred from the drawing. And then what the system does is it generates data, including, including in, by injecting noise to train machine learning model to recognize this. This will take, depending on the number of gestures, you have a few minutes. And then you can test this instantaneously. So here, we go back to the app to test it. And you see, he, he draws an X. It's not a replica of what he drew earlier. Yet at the bottom right hand side, you can see with the arrow, it's 100% accuracy. So it's really that simple. You draw, and uh, you train without providing any data, and you test. So how, you. how can the viewers try this out at home, or just try this out? So we have right now a cloud-based SDK for motion sensors and touch sensors. Uh, you can access it by going to our website, uh, www.motiongestures.com. Uh, I don't know if uh, we can get that view. Do oh, I think we have a link in the description, and if not, we'll post one later. Okay, so what you can do is when you go to our website, there is uh, at the top right-hand side, there is a sign-in button. You, you, when you click on that, it gives you a registration option. You can register for a free account, no questions asked, free is free. 
and you can, um, all you need is an Android phone for you to build and test the system. And one other comment, all the demos that I've showed you, they are available uh, from Microchip. Just contact your local Microchip rep and we can provide you with the software. And, uh, and that's about it. Cool, thank you. So um, what's it like to go into production with this? What, what would it be like for somebody starting out to actually make a product and deploy it? Production, Rachel, is very simple, straightforward. All a client needs to do is to specify the gestures that they want. And by specify, I mean they can simply draw the gestures on a paper. Uh, and what we can do is we can create uh, the gesture software for them and we can release to them a binary that they can run on the platform of their choice. If they are happy with the results, we can then you know, give them the library and the model that they can link via tool chain to deploy on the chip or integrate into the program. If they're not happy, there's some recognition issues, again, we can have another iteration and, uh, and uh, until they're satisfied. It's a pretty straightforward process. Great, and um, last question, how do you support customers in their proof of concepts? So uh, we have forged a partnership with Microchip, something Neelam alluded to earlier. That's why the software has been optimized to run on Microchip's platforms. So we are offering to engage in free, free means free, please, uh, proof of concepts. Uh, actually, we have the ability to engage in the first 25 proof of concepts completely free of charge with 25 different customers. And again, whether it's for motion sensors or touch sensors, just specify uh, what gestures you want, just specify the platform on which they need to run. We'll work with you to create the software and provide it to you 100% free of charge. So how do people claim that? Uh, I think they should contact their local uh, microchip rep okay. and have right. the rep uh, you know, reach out to us and then we will liaison directly with the customer with microchip rep in the loop and provide the gesture software. Cool, great. I think we also have a question in the booth. Yes, we do. We have a, actually have a lot of discussion. So many. Yeah, yeah, I have to admit that it is going really well. I, I'd awesome. like to thank everybody who's participating in the, in the uh, discussion. Uh, we have Mark asking how many different gestures can this system handle? It's a great question, Mark, and there is no simple answer to this. Still, I'll try to answer it. First, you need to take into account the computation resources. I gave you one data point, which is the ARM Cortex M0 chip. On that chip, we can, let's say, put in eight distinct gestures with, let's say, six variations of each gesture. So six times eight is 48. That alone should give you a good idea. Another way to look at it is, from a computation resource point of view, our core library, which interprets um, gestures, that's about five kilobytes. 5KB, not MB, KB. This is for motion and touch uh, gestures, uh, obviously, not for camera. And so about 100, uh, and, and in about 100 kilobytes, you can put in, like I said, about 48 different variations of gestures. So you can scale up from that. Uh, with, with Cortex M4, you can put significantly more gestures, including variations of each gestures. And obviously, and obviously a lot more on an A5. So that's from a computation resource point of view. The second thing you need to take into account is the variation in gestures. So here the basic rule is if it's difficult, let's say for a human eye, to distinguish between two gestures because they're very similar. It, for example, it happens in our verbal communications when two words almost sound the same. We can't tell the difference. You will have you will encounter a similar problem, you know, with with gesture recognition as well. Though that problem can be reduced by making gestures, I would say, more distinct from each other. Uh, more, over to Great, Rachel. that's a good question. Um, is there anything else? I think we might have to kind of limit it because we are running a little short on time. So, one last question. Okay. Because sure. I think there are a lot of discussions regarding to like the machine learning itself. Some people are asking if uh, the gesture can differentiate between uh, two different people? Like, can you differentiate gestures between two diff different people? I think this question applies to camera-based uh, gesture recognition. So our focus is only on hand tracking and 
uh, gesture and, and hand-based gesture recognition. When I say hand, obviously it includes fingers as well. And this can apply to any number of people. So it's very difficult to identify people with their hands unless you are looking at their, at their fingerprints, which we are not. So the answer to your question is no. We, you can't identify people, but there are ways around it. We are providing only hand tracking and gesture recognition, again. So you can implement or integrate this technology with other complementary technologies. For example, you can integrate this with facial recognition. So facial recognition gives you the ID and the gesture, and then you use our hand tracking and gesture recognition to attribute gestures to that person. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it, for example, in an automotive environment, when you know where people will be in what position, you can sort of limit gestures to, let's say, gestures being made by a person who is in the driver's seat and ignore other gestures. That's another technique. There are also techniques that can be used with cameras. That depends, obviously, on the camera. For example, with time-of-flight cameras, which give you depth information and also have a specific range, you can play with the range to ignore you know, any, any hand detection beyond a certain, certain range. So that will cut down you know, extraneous background information. So the things can be done, you know, uh, with, with camera parameters and other technologies to limit gestures to a particular individual. I think as if, if I can just chime in one very quick, uh, simple answer to this specific question is that in your system, if there are two hands shows up in the in the in the camera, mm -hmm. your system actually tracks both those hands separately, whether it's both hands from the same person or two different people showing one hand each and it would recognize uh, different gestures on those two different hands, correct? 100% correct. Uh, uh, I should have clarified it. Thank you, Neelam, for bringing this up. So the system assigns a unique hand ID to every hand that comes in camera view. This is, uh, as Neelam has specified, and that hand ID is unique to each hand. So let's say there are 10 hands that come into the view. Each would be assigned a unique ID. And that's where you can attribute gestures to to the hand based on the ID. And here's something more. Even if I, let's say if I'm a, as the operator, were to overlap my hands, this is a very difficult problem to solve, by the way, uh, but we have solved it. Even if you overlap your hands, the, the, each hand retains its unique ID. So even no matter how the yeah. overlapping so takes that's, place, it, 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 it won't lose it. Yeah, ahead, so that's, that's, the, that's the great thing about this system. Uh, sorry to chime in. I think I know we are running short on time. I want to make sure one clarification that our audience uh, uh, is fully aware of. Uh, today, this technology from motion gestures available from microchip via microchip for touch and motion sensors right away using our microcontrollers. The camera based technology is coming soon on different platforms. It's not available right away just so that uh, you're aware. However, we are very, very keen to understand your interest on camera-based systems. So feel free to give your input and, and let us know uh, your interest about camera and we will come back to you on when and how it's, uh, we, we make it available. Uh, one comment I would like to make, it seems you know people are quite curious. If you go to YouTube, go to Motion Gestures channel. It's again, Motion Space Gestures. And then go to playlists. There are four playlists. As Neela mentioned, the motion and touch uh, gesture system is already available on microchips uh, platforms. So if you go to the uh, uh, SDK playlists, you can see actually a tutorial on how to create gestures with motion and, and touch uh, sensors using the cloud SDK that I mentioned earlier. They're about 15 minutes each and uh, with no cuts, no edits. So you basically what you see is what will happen in real time. Mm. I recommend that. And then okay. there are also demos in the three other playlists for motion uh, gestures, touch gestures, and camera gestures. And the case you asked me earlier about hand ID and hand overlapping is also covered there. Great. Um, so I think, um, is there anything else in the booth? I think we're kind of, we probably should wrap up our main session right now. Um, so I've received directives from on high to ask as many questions as I can in this yeah, period of time. Yeah, it's being really hard. Right, right, right. Yeah. So really quickly, can you guys uh, predict force using the visual gesture? No, uh, we cannot predict force. Um, we can approximate it. This is a tricky, tricky question. Again, I want to answer it as an engineer. 
So we can give some approximation. For example, if you're doing tapping, apart from det detecting tapping, we can give some idea at to, at, as with what speed some tapping took place. But that's not a proxy for force. Force is very precise, at least from an engineering point of view. Here is another example I can give you. Because we can do, remember, joint level hand detection, and that too using 21 joints in each hand. That allows for very precise movements. So let's say you have a rotary dial. Without, we can tell how much, whether the dial was turned, but by how much the dial was turned, even if the dial was in, in front of me. So let's say you have volume control, you know all the way it, it has been turned, or 30%, same with sliders, but, but not force precisely. Yeah, I think uh, we, we have seen many other um, AI-based uh, recognition system with cameras, and the velocity or the speed with which the object is moving is absolutely trackable, and that can be, let's say, calculated into the force, provided you know uh, the weight and, and the mass and uh, everything else involved there. But directly recognizing or measuring force is, is not uh, obviously feasible because there's no there's no weight or force sensor uh, in the camera system, right? But absolutely, there are systems available where you can you can track the velocity or speed, and then you can derive the force out of it. Uh, it's probably not very suitable directly to the motion gestures technology. We have other other uh, other tools in our arsenal we can uh, we can bring to the table for the right um, uh, you know right application so yeah reach out to us and we will we will see if we can help you all right um, and maybe we'll take another question so if there's so many so back to the booth uh, give us one moment to find you guys a good one sorry <laughs> okay um, in the meantime uh, just remember, if you wanted the Sam D, sorry, it's the Sam D. I can't remember which one we're giving away. Uh, Sam D twenty one Curiosity Nano. We have five available. They'll drop a survey link if they haven't already, um, and just fill out that survey. So that's the Sam D twenty one Curiosity Nano. Um, and there's also something else I wanted to plug a little bit today, which is we're releasing a new board actually today. Um, so if you guys were here yesterday, you heard about the AVRIO TWG, which is the Google Cloud board. We released a version for AWS today. Um, and I actually got 15 in. So if you go on AVR Freaks, add a comment. I will DM you at the end of the week, and I will send you a free AVROTWA. So it's an AVROT for Amazon. Just released today. Super cool. Uh, highly recommend. So we have another one. This one is from Jared Munch. And he asks, are the gestures in static memory? In example, could gestures be stored on QSPI or memory mapped or external flash? They can be stored anywhere. They simply need to be referenced by the, uh, by the application. So you have a lot of flexibility there. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we, we have already dropped the uh, yes. survey link. Oh. <laughs> so somebody might be already selected to, to get the samples. Now. Very likely. In addition to that, the five lucky people from yesterday's live stream, we've reached out already. So check your email if you feel like, uh, or if you've completed the survey um, and reach out to us. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kashif. It's great to have you. Um, this was really cool to get a different perspective. Uh, Neelam, thank you so much for Skyping in. Uh, love to hear your perspective. I'm really glad we were able to communicate with you today. Um, and just so everybody knows, this is not the end of AI Day. We'll be talking to Adafruit this afternoon in a few hours. Um, and we're going to learn about TensorFlow Lite and how they make AI as easy as Python. So they'll be showing us how they use CircuitPython and TensorFlow. Um, so really excited for that. So stay tuned. Um, that's later today. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Thank, thank you, you Kasif. So Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you, you everyone. everyone. Thank you.